this evening. We're so glad to show to be in worship with us tonight. Just want to remind you that Quantum House will is tomorrow night. And also, want to remind you that this Sunday, it's All Saints Sunday. And uh, one of the few times All Saints, Sunday, All Saints Day is on All Saints Sunday. And so, uh, but we want to invite you uh, to bring pictures of someone, of those who um, may be very important in your life that have gone on to be with the Lord. And we're going to put them on the altar all around up here. And at a, at a moment in the service, we'll have a very special moment of recognition and remember our great cloud of witnesses coming from that great passage in, in Hebrews chapter. It says, We're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Let us run the race that is set before us. And so we want you to be mindful that we bring with you pictures that you can put on the altar of your great cloud of witnesses. Now, bring them one hour later than you normally do. Because we all back this uh, Saturday night. You get an extra hour to sleep this Saturday night. And so, we want you to remember that. Uh, I, you know, I just want to thank uh, Stephanie for the card connection venture. Uh, there was a lot of cards. And, and thank God, lots of folks came in. And, Twenty-four people came in and signed cards with us, and so we just thank God for all of those uh, and thank you as well. Um, also, I want you to know that uh, we do have live calls on Sunday mornings at nine o'clock in the fellowship hall, and so we remind you of that. Also, Glenn's reading room on the 14th and 28th coming up. We also, we may have the inquiry membership class on the on the 14th as well at 10 o'clock in. Frank and um, Frank Hall, not Frank Hall, but Frank Hall. And so be mindful of that as well. Amen? If you love the Lord, say amen. If you love the Lord, say amen. amen. If you love the Lord, let's worship tonight. I know the song is, let down your neck. Lay it out of the wall. Let down your neck. Way down in the water, there's a blessing way you cannot look at. Let down your neck. Way down in the water, pouring out that power of rain. Way down your neck. Way down in the water, there's a blessing way you cannot look at. Way down in the water, pouring out that fire and the rain. Why don't you let down your neck? Way down in the water, there's a blessing waiting you can have to pay. Let down your neck. Way down in the water. Pouring out that power of rain, I'm trading my sorrows, I'm trading my shame, I'm trading them for the joy of the Lord. I'm trading my sickness. I'm praying my pain. I'm praying down for the joy of the Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Amen. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Amen. I'm afraid I'm trading my sorrow. I'm trading my shame. I'm trading my past. For the joy of the Lord, I'm trading my sickness. 
seven most common causes of stress in our lives. And we're looking at God's antidote to them. And you find them all in that very familiar passage uh, from Psalms 23. Uh, tonight we're going to be talking about God's antidote to dizziness. <laughs> I said to someone today, I just don't like when God makes me live what I have to teach. <laughs> This, this particular lesson comes off one of the busiest weeks I've had, and I don't know when. And so, tonight, let's just look at God's antidote to busyness. Let us pray. God, we do thank you for this night. We thank you, Lord, because as we get past for the war, so our soul longs after you. God, this is a time of busyness, and we all could use the lesson in this and how to reduce stress in our lives. And so, God, I'm asking that you allow your word to come before, come through me tonight, that I might speak it in a bold and confident way to these your people. For I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. And amen. God's antidote to business. Uh, the reality is that we all like to think that... Um, we're pretty laid back, we're pretty cool, pretty calm and collected. But the fact of the matter is that most of us, if we admit it, are just wrapped up in busyness. Uh, so busy we can't even get to church on time. Uh, um, <laughs> I just couldn't let things get my <laughs> Um, a lot of us uh, who are even lazy, basically, are still busy trying not to be busy. Amen? 
But either way, a lot of folks in our community just become so stressed out, especially during holiday times and um, with busyness. Uh, and so in this lesson, we're going to look at the prescription for people who are under pressure. It turns out if you're addicted to busyness or if you're a workaholic, you need to ask yourself some questions. I would ask myself these questions. Am I always in a hurry? Am I always in a hurry? Is my to-do list unrealistically too long? You know, some of you are great at making lists and you never get to the things on the list. Maybe because it's unrealistically too long. Uh, ask yourself, do I use my days off to catch up with unfinished work? I didn't like the answer to some of these questions when I asked them of me. Uh, as she said, has more than one person told me to slow down? Ask yourself, do I feel guilty when I relax and just do nothing? Ask yourself this question too. Do I have to get sick before I take time off? Those are questions. Those are good questions that will let you know whether you are busy being busy or if you're a workaholic. For many of us, those questions really describe our lives. And, and we need to understand that that's not kind of the kind of life that God wants us to have. Really. And so Psalms 127 and 2 says, It's senseless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night. God wants His loved ones to get their proper rest. I didn't say that the book says it. I just need to heed it. I the whole time. Let me tell you something. If you burn the candle at both ends, you're not as bright as you think you are. Amen? I mean, sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is just go home and go to bed. That's what I did Sunday. I was well, I, with great intention, I wanted to get up and go, but when I turned over, it was over. <laughs> Amen? And, and after last week's marathon, that's the way it was Sunday. And you know what I did Sunday? Nothing. I laid on the couch. I got up. I didn't even fix something. I got something that was left over me. That's my Monday. And I didn't care. And I felt good about it. And And so... Um, I just chilled out Monday. And um, normally I would feel bad, but I had started working on this stuff, and I said, I'm going to try it. But then Tuesday, I went right back to this stuff. Many people, you know, think that if I give my life to God and, and I'm on fire for the Lord, maybe I'm going to have too much to do and I have more than I already have to do. Uh, well, let me tell you something. Psalms 23 and 2 says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside steel walls. So how do you unwind the way God does? You do just what, this, uh, what the uh, passage of Scripture did. It says, if you were a sheep, you'd understand this passage. Amen? And by, what's the reason Jesus called us sheep? Amen? This is a perfect picture of how to a paradise right here. These are the images of the uh, of psalmist is referring to you. And what he's referring to is rest and refreshment. Rest and refreshment. If you look at this, it says, He leads me to green pastures. He leads me beside. It makes a lot of other because He leads me beside quiet water. God is interested in your rest and your recreation. And God wants us to have whole, balanced, and complete lives. He doesn't want us working all the time. I'm preaching to myself tonight, okay? And if you really give your life to Jesus Christ, He's not going to add more to you, right? More for you to do. He probably, if you listen to Him, He's probably going to tell you to stop doing some of the stuff you're doing. Because a lot of times, a lot of stuff we're doing... It's not what he's going to do. It's what we think we ought to be doing. I was approached coming into the sanctuary tonight by a deacon. 
There was someone down in the dip that's going to come up and go, who has a son? And my immediate response was, good, to fit right into the lesson of life. And so, he just said, you hear about it, okay? And so, I was reading where a, a CNN poll said recently that 59% of all Americans would like to slow down and relax more. A Harris poll said that we have 8.5 hours less leisure time a week than we did just a decade ago. In other words, we are working more and enjoying relaxing. So I'm going to use a little acrostic tonight called Relax. <laughs> and you'll notice on the last one I sort of cheated a little bit, didn't I? Hey, you can take liberties, amen? And, and I'm going to use this little acrostic to talk about uh, how God wants precious people to relax God's way. And so go with me. The R stands for what? Realize your word. Do you know the reason that a lot of folks overwork is because they confuse their work with their worth? I mean, we think that if we work a whole lot, achieve a whole lot, we're going to be worth a lot. And so we confuse what we do with who we are. And in America, we primarily, for some reason, get our identity, our primary identity, from what we do. And when we meet someone after we ask their name, what's the first question after that? What do you do? We, we didn't pick that up by accident. We get our work, we think, from our work. And the Bible doesn't teach that at all. But it says that our work is regardless of what our work is. And maybe you grew up where someone told you you were nobody. Maybe a teacher or former friend or brother or sister or parent said, you're never going to amount to anything. And so the real reason you overwork is you think, I'm going to show them. I'll prove my word. And you think your accomplishments and your achievements will do that. And the problem is, you will never accomplish enough to feel satisfied if that's why you're doing it. Amen? Anybody remember the old nursery rhyme? Sticks and stones. They break my bones. But names what? That's a lie. It's just a lie. Names do hurt. Names last far longer than broken bones. Broken bone heals six to eight weeks. Okay, and some of y'all will eight or ten weeks. Okay, I take a little longer. But some of you, years later, 20, 30 years later from when it happened, you are still hearing that inner voice from somebody saying, you're never going to watch nothing. You ain't worth nothing. You're nobody. And you keep paddling, keep working. Somebody, um, and you do it because somebody may catch up with you and get ahead of you. And so you've got to prove your value. You've got to prove your significance. You've got to prove your worth. And so you find yourself busy, overworking, and you never calm down. The antidote to dizziness is to realize that what God says about you. Look at what James, first chapter 18 verse in the New Century Version says. God decided to give us life through the word of truth so that we might be what? The most important of all things he knows. God says, of all things God made and God loves everything God made, he says, you have high value over everything else. God says, no matter what else went on in creation, He loved everything in creation because He made it. Remember that Genesis story when He made it, He said, it is. And then He says, you are the top. You're the pinnacle of my creation. And I'm me and I'm okay because God don't make no joke. Amen? And if you really understand that, if you really feel your worth to God, then, not just knowing it, but when you really feel it, it'll change your life. Let me tell you something. It might shock you to know that I haven't always been outgoing. As a little kid, I was 
very shy. I know that's shy. I know some of you don't struggle to believe that. But up until I was uh, probably in the sixth grade, I was painfully shy. I would sit right there and not say a word to anybody. And you know what? You think maybe my mom, the reason I love my mom so much, I can still remember to this day when she told me, you don't have to take a back seat to nobody. You're special. And whether she was telling me the truth or a lie, I chose to believe her. I came out of that. I used to care a lot about what people thought about me. What people said to me could hurt me. I've had those things said to me. You're just never going to amount to anything. I've had teachers to say that to me. But when my mama said, you're special, I chose to believe her. She was a great gift to me. You know what? I love all of you. But I'll tell you what you think about me. I really don't. You're not going to defame my life because you say something bad about me. I may slap you around. But I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But, but, but you see, what Mama did for me, God is going to do for you. I want you to know, and not just know it, but I want you to feel it. I want you to feel your worth to God. You know, if God likes me, and I like me, and you don't like me, that's your problem, not mine. Amen? And what I'm trying to tell you is, don't spend your whole life trying to, trying to win the approval of other people. That's silly. Because, you know, somebody who's your friend today may not be your friend tomorrow, and all that stuff they say to give you a day, they'll say to turn you down tomorrow. Why do you give people that kind of power over you? And? And so you need to, and so how you determine who you're valuable with is you determine what your value is to God. And where do you find that? You find that in God's Word. Jesus says in Matthew 6, 26, Your heavenly Father feeds the sparrows, and you are far more valuable to Him than they are. If God noticed the bird that falls from the air, and that's important to Him, and He says you are of so much more value to Him than that, don't that tell you how valuable you are to God? That God, why is it you don't think God will take care of you? Let me show three things, quick things with you. Number one, you're never going to know completely how much God loves you here on earth. Because your mind can't wrap around the greatness of God's love for you. In, in prayer on Wednesday night, at the end of every prayer, every Wednesday night, we close intercession prayer with this quote, we all say it together and we add in Jesus' name at the end of it. We all say, now glory be to God, who by God's mighty power at work within us is able to do far more than we would ever dare to think, ask, or it, than we'd ever dare to ask or even dream of. Infinitely high, beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, or hopes in Jesus' name. You see, your mind can't wrap around how much God loves you. It is so much good. You're never going to understand that. But if you can get a glimpse of it, it might help you where you were. The second thing is, you need to understand there is nothing, nothing you can do in this life that will ever make God love you any more than God loves you right now. You don't have to work for God's love. If you think that you have to be busy to please God, cut it out. Because there is nothing you can, that's the third thing is, you can't do anything to make God love you any less. Because it's not dependent on what you do, it's dependent on who God is. And God has said, I love you. I love you with an everlasting love. It has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with God. If you can understand that, then you will begin to realize your worth. Amen? You don't have to prove you were uh, overworking with business. God says you're okay, you're okay. Psalm Isaiah 48, 9 and 16 says, I have engraved you on the palm of my hand. 
You know, I love the imagery there. And Jesus died on the cross and they put the nails in his hand. It's sort of like Jesus said, I don't love you this much. This ain't about me dying a horrible death for your sins or anything like that. This is about, I love you this much. But I'm going to give myself. I have engraved you on the palm of my hand. He can never forget how much he loves you. So you need to realize you were. That's what the R is. Amen? The E is what? <laughs> Ephesians 3 13 says, Good news says, All of us should enjoy what we have worked for. It is God's gift. So many people become so preoccupied with getting more that they never take the time to enjoy what they have. I mean, you can be so busy acquiring more and more, you don't enjoy what you already have in your house, in your garage, in your storage bin. Some of you got stuff in storage bins you haven't seen in years. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, well. It's still the gospel. <laughs> I mean, you might have beautiful homes, and nobody, a lot of people have beautiful homes that they don't enjoy because nobody's at home. Amen? Stand late at the office, so you only run here, you only run there, and never take any time to enjoy. Now, I do have a bone to pick with, you know, leaders in the church who they all go to enjoy their time at the same time. Oh, I just say that. Just kidding. <laughs> Well, since I've thrown box away that work away, you know, it's full of the Let me tell you something. The desire to acquire and keeping up with the Joneses, uh, it, it, that desire to acquire is it, it, driven by keeping up with the Joneses. And, and you've heard what I think about that, don't you? Uh, uh, you know, because that, that's a major cause of business. They're trying to keep up with the Joneses, not realizing they just refinance. Okay? And, and, and also, they can't afford what they got. Amen? And, and so we try to get more, and like then we get overextended financially, and then we got to work even harder because you got to hustle to make ends meet, and we spend all our time making payments on this stuff we bought, and in the process, the relationships we have, we don't give any time to, any attention to. And the most important things in this world are not things. Amen? You cannot take it with you. Look what the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 4 and 6. It's better to have only a little of peace of mind than to be busy all the time. I didn't say that. The book said that. Amen? As a pastor, I've been by several deathbeds. Amen? And I've been there when people have taken their final breath, and not one time has anybody said, I wish I'd spent more time at the office. No, they always wish they had spent more time with their loved ones. You know, they'll say this, I've never seen a U-Haul behind a hearse. And so a lot of folks, if it were, it would get burned up. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> you can't take it with you. And, you know, in our culture, in American culture, it's, it's for some reason we treat it as though it's a tragedy to die poor or to die careless. I think what better way to go? You can use the magazine, now just go. <laughs> I look at it just the opposite way. What great time, and if you can do it, amen? Enjoy what you have while you have it, and don't be worried about getting all the more. Learn to enjoy what you have. Amen? Judy and I were talking today over breakfast after, at the hospital. And, and, and she was sharing with me how much she realized you don't, stuff you don't need when you don't have it. When you don't have it, you don't need it. I, I realized as I'm cleaning out stuff around the house, I feel long to this mess. And all they created was a back wall of me not being able to use my house. 
and you hear and, and you know, I, I was, I, I redid my office this other day, and, and uh, nice and clean, and junk, and the boxes in it, and everything. And I'm thinking, I messed with my box. I hadn't looked at it in years and years and years. Some of it I didn't even know I had. I forgot I had. We had it, and, and we forget we got it. But not enjoying what we have. Learn to enjoy what you have. Amen? Hell is what? Limit a labor. What am I talking about there? I'm talking about you got to make a conscious decision that you can make time for some other things other than work. That's hard for some of us. Ain't that my step? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding with this. But it, this is a real struggle for me. It really is. This is a struggle for me. Because I've got in the back of my mind that I'm supposed to be on 24 hours a day if I'm going to pass it. Let me tell you a little secret about me. When I leave Birmingham, I sleep so well. I never really sleep good here in Birmingham. You know why? I'm always on. And I can go to Atlanta. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? I can go to Atlanta and stay at Ian's house. That's two hours across the state line. I can fall asleep and leave and sleep nine, ten hours. I never sleep nine and ten hours in Birmingham. When I go on a cruise ship, I can wake up at noon and think, why am I getting up this early? <laughs> so I'm talking about me, and I bet it ain't that much different for some of you as well. Amen? And this is a real struggle. And, and you got to learn and got to decide how many hours I can realistically spend working each week and still leave some leeway uh, in my life. And I mean, my job is never going to be nine to five. I understand that. I understand that there's going to be emergencies like right this morning. I have to get up at 6 o'clock on my longest day of the week anyway and get to the hospital because someone got sick. I understand that. But you know what I used to? I used to feel guilty like if I took a few hours off the next day. I don't stop feeling guilty about that. You've even told me that. Even the treasurer. I don't quite want treasurer to tell me that. <laughs> but it's true. Amen. I need to schedule time for myself. I need to schedule time for my, you know, I, I'm one of those people I have to build in even time for God. I know that's terrible to say. And so there's a certain time. And so now, I, it's going to seem so regimented, but I, twice a day, I get the daily office. Be, that's not mine, is it? And I get the daily office. I don't know if you know what the daily office is. It's the scriptures and prayers and so forth. I get twice a day, and I don't do it at the time it comes in. Because it comes in at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, 2 o'clock in the morning. But I don't do it then. But twice a day, I take my time to read. Because there's scriptures in them. And then there's a, a prayer regimen in And I do that twice a day. Because if I don't, I get busy. And I won't do it. And then I'll start feeling guilty. I haven't had no time to learn with the Lord. And you see, God don't want us to feel guilty about that either. Amen? Yes, so, so, limit your labor. Ecclesiastes 10 and 15 says, Only someone too stupid to find his way home but wear him step out with work. I read that and I wanted to think, You know what I mean? If I'm always working all the time, I'm doing it. That's what that scripture says. The lady called the pastor one day and said, I called you on Monday and couldn't get through to you. The pastor said, Monday's my day off. And the woman said, well, the devil never takes a day off. And the pastor said, yes. And if I didn't take a day off, I'd be just like the devil. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Exodus 29, 10 says, this comes out of the big ten. You have six days in which to do your work, but the seventh day is a day of rest dedicated to me. God says that one day off every seven days is the rule. That's the fourth commandment. Part of the big ten. 
it's so important that God put it in there with don't commit adultery and don't commit murder. That's how serious this is to God. Every seventh day you take off. God says do it. Why did God say do that? The Bible calls it the Sabbath. Do you know what the word Sabbath means? It just means a day of rest. That's what the Sabbath means. It means a day of rest. And in Mark 2, Jesus said, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And Colossians told us, it doesn't matter what day you choose, just make sure you get one day off each week. And, as a pastor, let me tell you, my Sabbath is never going to be on Sunday. Because Sunday is a work day for me. Amen? So, what should you do with that day off, your Sabbath? You, you don't use it to catch up with work. You haven't finished. What do you do on your Sabbath? Three things. Number one is what? Rest your body. That's what I did Monday. I rested my body. I'm glad I read this, <laughs> read this and started working on this. I went back to it and was working on it. And I thought, this is a good day to practice it. And so I just rested. I laid up on that couch. I watched uh, TV. There was nothing worth on cable, so I cut on Netflix and watched some movies. All day Monday, all the way in about 11 o'clock at night, I was, I was feeding my face. I didn't go to the gym Monday. I just lay there and chilled out. Amen? Rest your body. If you don't take time to rest your body, your body will make you take time to rest yourself. Amen? And it will do it either... Uh, by putting you in the hospital or you getting a cold or the flu. Our best requires rest. During the French, French Revolution, they actually um, outlawed Sunday as a day of rest. And then a few years later, they had to reinstate it quickly. Why? Not for religious reasons, but because the health of the nation had collapsed. They were all burnt out. That's a historical lesson right there. Some of us feel guilty when we relax. Let me tell you, Jesus didn't. Amen? He took time off. Are you busier than Jesus? <laughs> you might say, well, yes, I am. Well, okay, let me ask you another question. Is what you're doing more important than what Jesus did? I don't think so. You need to rest your body. The second thing, reason you take the Sabbath is what? You've got to recharge your emotions. What things recharge you emotionally? You need to have something that you do that's mindless. That you just purely enjoy doing. The only reason you do it is it it's fun for you to do. It's different for everyone and everyone. But you need to have something that you do that doesn't have a little work to it. It just brings you joy. That's the best thing you can do. When you get the power, Ron, I'm going to kill you. I am going to beat you as you walk out the door tonight. I still, don't think I can't read, and don't think I can't speak. <laughs> Let me tell you something. You need time to just enjoy the when you're to Do something that just brings you pure fun. And you know what? There was an article in uh, Time magazine that talked about how uh, you also need to take that Sabbath for building relationships. If you got a significant other. On your day off, if you both can be off that day, you need to spend some time just to make them happy. That don't go there. I know where your mind went. Think outside the box. <laughs> That's a bad word to say that. <laughs> Think of something that just makes them happy that you can do for them that day. And vice versa. Work on building your relationship. Amen? 
Comrade Green in an article called 21st Century Blues talked about stress, anxiety, and depression and being trouble and stuff. And so basically, and what the article basically it says, we don't live in the way we're supposed to be. It, it goes on to say, we are designed to seek trust in relationships. And the problem is that too few of the people in our lives create trust in relationships with us. And it says, you need time in your significant other relationships for nothing other than just to recharge your emotions with that person. That that can give you incredible, incredible sense of relaxedness. I thought that was important. I thought that was important. And then the third thing is you need to what? What do we call that? Worship. Amen? Worship has a way of bringing things in perspective. Um, when you come to church with a big problem, sometimes just being in worship can put things in perspective. Worship has a way sometimes of giving you energy and, 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 and understanding to deal with problems. Sometimes, when I seem like I'm a little off-key at the door of the church uh, after the service, Two things are going on. I get high from the service. I don't know if that's worked for you. But as a pastor, I get emotionally and spiritually high just from being in worship. And sometimes when I'm a little space cadet right after the service, I've been thinking about something and I've had an insight. And I can't wait to get away from here so I can think about it. I can't really think about it right now. I know what it is. I can't really put... Yeah, I can't... Settled on it. And so I, I, I'm happy and I'm bouncing to say goodbye to folks and, and greet folks. But in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, I know a way to deal with this. And it's because I've done that perspective just from being in worship. Worship can do that for you. Amen? And so you need time with God. If you're too busy to take the time with God, you're too busy. Amen? So you need to refocus your mind. You know, uh, refocus your emotions. Now, to make time for people who are important in your life and God, you need to do the last two things. And the, and, and the A stands for what? What? In order to reduce stress in my life, I've got to think about what's really important. You see, some of us are drama queens. And we treat every little thing like it's important. And it ain't. We treat what somebody said to us as important as if they don't pay any of your bills. We treat what someone said high to us as very important, as if that's going to add one day to your life. You have got to learn to change your thinking about what is important. Ecclesiastes 4 and 4 says, I've learned why people work so hard to see is because they ended the things they made with them. You have to stop. You say, you're not going to get caught up in the rat, rat race anymore. Mark 8 and 6, 36 says, what good is the man gaining the whole world for the soul? Is it really worth it? Ask yourself this question every time in your life. Maybe you make pretty good money. But is my relationship getting better or bitter? <laughs> or is it just sitting there? And she said, I'm not going to look back and regret the time, not making time for the people that are most important in my life. No matter how much you make, you know you can lose it any time, don't you? So decide that relationships are more important in your life and give them priority by adjusting your values. Amen? And the last one is the actors for what? I cheated. <laughs> Couldn't think of X. I thought to say X-ray your pressure, but that didn't work. So <laughs> X is for what? This gets to the root of stress in our lives. There are three kinds of being a fatigue. There is physical fatigue. And physical fatigue is where you have tired muscles and, 
and they could be replenished pretty quickly, except I noticed that the older I get, the longer they take. But it's still pretty quick. And then there's emotional fatigue. That's when your emotions get tired and your feelings get tired and it begins to wear you down. Because if you emotionally fatigue, it also affects your physical. Do I have that right, nurses? But then there is spiritual fatigue. That's worse. Spiritual fatigue is when you have a dry spirit. Have you ever had a dry spirit? I ever ran into a time where you're sitting in church, you just don't feel it. Anybody ever been there? That's the deepest. And you might need a vacation, but vacation ain't gonna help that much because ain't gonna ain't gonna help the emotional fatigue and the spiritual fatigue. For that, you need to revitalize your relationship with God. Michael P. Oz said something one time saying about life here when he was visiting our church and he was saying that, you know, so often we get in to where we get so used to what goes on around our church that it just don't feed us anymore and we start saying, I just didn't get fed. He said, that's the time you look down the queue and see if anybody else is being fed. And then you get up and try to serve them. I think he's right. Because there comes a time in your spiritual life you cannot just sit here and eat. You, in your spiritual life, you got to get up and serve somebody before you. I remember at my house, my mama always ate bread. Why? She served first. Then she ate. And I asked her, and I asked her, I said, why don't you eat with her? She said, I'll get I'll eat. And she was happy to serve her. She loved us. And she got nourished now. And he, if you sit here, just waiting to be fed, there's going to come a time in your spiritual life that will not satisfy you anymore. And was it you that said it Sunday that you heard the pastor say one time, take off a beard and put on an apron? Did you, did you, you, yeah, did you hear me say that? Why did I say that? Let me tell you something. If you're a Christian, you will only exchange your stress for God's peace when you learn to take off your apron, and, uh, take off your beard and put on an apron. Because the only way you can exchange your pressure for God's peace is you've got to be working where God's peace is. Say that again. Even the Catholics are giving it to God. Amen. It means readjusting your value, exchanging your push. A little child doesn't like to lay down and rest. Resistance to rest is a mark of immaturity. And so, you know, we, 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 we don't want, we, we want to be fed, but we don't feel comfortable. And so we resist it. And so God has, did you read what that pastor says? This? He makes me lie down. So she don't like to lie down. Okay. Psalm 23, he makes it. That's a full thing. God ever made you lie down? If you don't slow down, sometimes God will make you lie down. Is it because God's upset with you? No. It's because God loves you so much, he knows what you're going to do to yourself if you don't lie down. And rest. Amen. God created your body, your mechanism makes you rest. He cares about you, you matter to him. If you don't get to rest, he knows there's going to be some very adverse consequences that are going to happen. And that's why you need a relationship with God who will help you set the pace of your life. I, I, I think I gave this to folks uh, several years ago, and I went back and dug it up. 
and I'm going to give it to you again, and, and, and sister's going to be at the door, and you can get one as you leave tonight. It's a paraphrase of Psalms 23. Let me read it to you. I like this one. Now, don't go publishing this because I can't remember where I got it, and so I, I don't want to go to jail. <laughs> but it says, The Lord is my case seller. I shall not rush. He makes me stop and rest at intervals. He provides me with images of stillness to restore my serenity. He leads me in the way of efficiency to calmness of mind and this guidance, this peace. And even though I have a great many things to accomplish this day, I will not fret for His presence this year, His timeliness. His all importance will keep me in balance. He prepares refreshment and renewal in the midst of my activity, anointing my head with oils of tranquility. My cup, joyous, joy, my cup of joyous energy overflows. Surely harmony and effectiveness shall be the fruits of my hours. I shall walk in the pace of the Lord and dwell in his heaven forever. I like that. Pick up a copy on the bed. You need a pace setter for your life so you don't go too fast or too slow. And the only person wise enough to do that outside of yourself is Jesus Christ. You need a relationship with him where you exchange your pressure for his peace. And when you live for God, it's the only way that's healthy, a whole way, a balanced way. It's a more relaxing way. Jesus said in Matthew uh, 11, I think it is, Come unto me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will refresh you. I will give you peace. The load you carry will be light. Let me ask you tonight as you close. Has there been any time in the last couple of months where you've been stressed out? Any time when you've really been tired at your wit's end, maybe you will really. Jesus is coming to me. I'm not going to give more, you know, a more heavier load. I didn't come to do that. I came to give you some rest. I came to give you peace from your business. I love that little chorus that we're going to sing. Peace, peace. Wonderful people. Amen. Thank you. Anointing my head 
with all the tranquility. Allow God's peace to cause you to relax. Chill out, baby. And relax. On this time, amen. Could you hear from the middle, Lord? Part between me and thee. While we ask you. One from the other. Amen.